Okay, up next we have Peter Sonic with what is new in sudo and syslog ng. Hi, uh, I'm Peter, and uh, let me uh, mm, say a few words about myself. Uh, I work at One Identity, which is upstream for Syslog ng, and in a way also for sudo. Uh, well, uh, Todd Miller, maintainer of sudo, is my colleague, but sudo itself is not uh, One Identity software. Uh, I help with RPM and FreeBSD packaging of Syslog ng. Uh, and I'm blogging uh, about this software and speak at open source events. So let me give you a quick overview of what I'm talking about today. Uh, I try to de define what is sudo, what is syslog ng, and how they are related to each other. Then uh, I will uh, mention a few version numbers, uh, which uh, versions you should use if you want to test uh, what I'm talking about here today. Uh, then I will show you a couple of new sudo features released in the past one and a half, two years. And uh, at the end, uh, and, I, uh, and I, I will also show you a couple of syslog ng configurations related to these sudo features. And at the end, I will introduce you to uh, syslog ng uh, for news, which is expected to be released in the coming month. So, what is sudo? Uh, I heard quite a few e explanations from users as I asked it, asked, uh, it a thousand times at least uh, at various conferences and events, and got. Uh, and many people told me that, well, sudo is just a prefix for administrative commands. So here is a, the definition from the sudo website showing that it's a bit more. Sudo allows a system administrator to delegate authority by giving certain users the ability to run some commands as root or another user while providing an audit trail of the commands and their arguments. So even this one shows that it's a lot more, but you will see that uh, there is a lot more to do with sudo. Here is a very basic sudo ers file. This is what comes installed by default on most systems. Uh, we, here, members of the wheel group has, uh, have practically all uh, rights on, uh, on the given uh, host. Uh, the various fields here means uh, who, uh, on which machines, on, on which users, and which comments are allowed. And you see that practically anything is allowed uh, for members of the wheel group. Uh, but even this very simple configuration is uh, pretty useful, as if you have uh, more than one administrator, then you will see who did what on, on a system. Uh, so uh, unlike when you share the root password, and all you see in, in your logs that uh, root user did that or that, but no, nothing more to who was actually running those commands. And uh, so what the sudo uh, does, it can control and log access. Uh, you, you have seen the previous uh, slide uh, that you can control who, d who does what, and it is w uh, nicely logged in your, uh, in, on your system. But uh, not just that, uh, sudo can rec record everything what is happening on your terminal and even what you are typing in a sudo session and play it back just like a movie. And sudo itself is modular, which means that uh, most of its, its features are implemented as plugins and uh, you can uh, replace those or extend your, with your own code. Uh, recently even uh, using Python. And uh, how is uh, syslog ng is created? Well, uh, it's developed at the same company, but also uh, syslog ng is parsing sudo logs automatically uh, and creates name value pairs from the uh, different values in the sudo log messages, which makes uh, alerting from sudo logs uh, much more easier and also storing uh, the sudo logs into various NoSQL databases, so you can easily uh, search uh, what is happened in sudo sessions and create reports and so on. 
which is not so easy if you do not pass the wrong messages. Uh, I mentioned that uh, you can extend uh, sudo. Uh, it has various APIs. My uh, favorite one is the IOX API, which gives you access to uh, input and output from user sessions. Uh, I created a couple of Python examples. Uh, one is a simple data leak prevention that uh, syslogng, uh, sudo is checking what is uh, wrote to the uh, terminal buffer and terminates the sudo session before it could appear on the screen. Or you can also implement a mm, command line analysis into uh, in, in using Python and uh, terminate a session before something nasty happens. Uh, here is a very simple uh, example code. It's just five lines, or, well, six. Uh, and uh, what it does that uh, it's checking the uh, terminal buffer and if a given text uh, in this case my secret appears uh, in the terminal buffer then uh, it writes an error message and terminates the sudo session before uh, it could be displayed on the screen and it's really just uh, six lines of code uh, so, what is syslogng? It's an enhanced uh, logging daemon with a strong focus on portability and high performance uh, central log collection. It was originally developed in C, but uh, now it can also be extended using Java and Python. So, uh, practically any features can be of syslogng can be uh, extended using Python. Uh, Oh, here are the four major roles of uh, syslogng. Uh, using syslogng, you can collect log messages. Uh, it has uh, various di drivers for platform-specific sources, so uh, it can collect uh, log messages on all of the BSD variants. Uh, of course, Linux uh, journal uh, on also the journal, and, and uh, you can implement your own source drivers using Python. You can process log, log messages like parsing uh, uh, JSON messages or uh, freeform messages using PathTimeDB and many other parsers uh, to create name value pairs from log messages, as uh, those enable you easy, easier filtering of log messages. Oh, you can also rewrite log messages, and you don't have to think about falsifying log messages when it comes to rewriting, but for example, anonymization of log messages like removing usernames or IP addresses or credit card numbers of, as re required by PCI DSS and so on. Uh, you can filter log messages, which means uh, throwing away surplus log messages and routing log messages to the right destinations. And finally, mm, you need to uh, store uh, log messages somewhere either locally or forwarding to another syslogng server or uh, writing to a database, Elasticsearch, MongoDB, and so on. So um, there are many possibilities. And if you do not find the driver uh, for a specific destination, then uh, you can either use one of the generic drivers like uh, the HTTP destination, which is used by uh, Elasticsearch, um, Telegram, uh, Slack, and other cloud-based destinations. Uh, or you can write your own destination as well easily in, in C, Java, or Python. Uh, what I show you in my, uh, in my talk uh, requires pretty recent versions of sudo and syslogng. Uh, on the sudo side, 198 uh, is needed if you want to uh, use uh, subcommand logging, which I will show you. Uh, and on the syslogng side, at least 3.31, uh, as that's the version which can uh, work with JSON formatted sudo logs. If you want to test uh, syslogng for features, then you need at least 3.37. Uh, 
we also have uh, already 38 released. The good news is that uh, the various BSD ports are pretty up to date. From sudo, all of them have the very latest version. Uh, and uh, for Syslog-ng, uh, uh, mo mostly as well, FreeBSD is always up to date, and the others are usually just one or two versions behind, so uh, are also mostly quite up to date. A bit history of the Syslog-ng port uh, in FreeBSD. It's in... Uh, it's in the FreeBSD port uh, since uh, the year 2000, so just when the Syslog-ng project was two years old. Uh, but it was not really much, really well maintained. Uh, in 2011, I helped to update uh, um, Syslog-ng port uh, from version one to, uh, to the version three series. And I work with the uh, uh, port maintainer uh, quite close and ever since, which means that uh, usually uh, FreeBSD is the first one to receive a new uh, Syslog-ng version, uh, often more, uh, a lot more earlier than any of the Linux distributions. Uh, in 2012, I was at uh, FOSDAM at a talk uh, in the BSD dev room. I do not remember anymore uh, which appliance uh, was giving a talk there, mm, probably Freeness or PFSense, I, I'm not sure anymore, but there was a talk about uh, extending an, uh, a FreeBSD-based appliance with various uh, features from ports. And uh, after the talk, I went there that, well, uh, using the uh, description you gave uh, in your talk, uh, installing Syslog-ng is not possible, and then uh, why? Is, is some, Syslog ng something interesting? Yes, it's a nice logging uh, software. Uh, uh, I'm part of the team and I would be happy to see Syslog ng on the appliance. Uh, discussion stopped. I, I have never heard back uh, from the guy again. On the other hand, half a year later, I realized that uh, it appeared in the uh, first, uh, first FreeBSD based appliance. Uh, and uh, soon, practically all FreeBSD-based appliances had Syslog-ng inside. So it, 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 it was all just a discussion after a FOSDAM talk. <laughs> and uh, in year uh, 2020, I had an experiment that, well, uh, I'm helping with FreeBSD, but there are quite a few other uh, BSD variants as well. So I took a look uh, at the various uh, BSDs and uh, found that uh, quite a few of them are not really up to date when it comes to uh, the Syslog-ng port. So I helped up to, uh, update the various uh, ports with, uh, to the latest Syslog-ng version and also uh, helped to merge uh, Syslog-ng fixes from ports, which means that right now, uh, as far as I'm no, uh, I know, uh, you can compile uh, Syslog-ng on any of the BSD variants without needing any patches, which makes maintaining uh, Syslog-ng a lot more easy in the various BSD, BSDs. Uh, here is a not really politically correct uh, cartoon from XKCD, uh, which describes uh, how most of the users imagine sudo is working. Uh, make me a sandwich. What? Make it yourself. Sudo, make me a sandwich. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, if you uh, are not really offended by this uh, little cartoon, I have a couple of uh, stickers uh, uh, with this, and also the sudo logo, uh, logo which is uh, based on this uh, little cartoon. Mm, I have a couple of uh, stickers with me. So let's go to the uh, latest features. Uh, as I'm coming uh, from the, from uh, the Cisco Ng world, uh, my favorite uh, new feature is uh, about logging. 
uh, starting with sudo 194 uh, you can uh, turn on json formatted logging uh, in sudo uh, and now comes a, a kind of zigzag as i will also show you a couple of syslogng configurations uh, how to configure syslogng for sudo log messages uh, this, this is our starting configuration for syslogng. Well, it's not the whole configuration, uh, but the part for sudo logging. Uh, as you can see, uh, the syslogng configuration is built uh, from building blocks, and uh, these blocks are connected together. Uh, so here we have a, a, a filter block, which is selecting sudo log messages. Then uh, we have a file destination for, uh, to store log messages. And then finally, we have a log path uh, which connects all of these building blocks together. Well, the source is not shown here uh, on the slide, but uh, we have a source uh, from where we are reading uh, the log messages. Then we have a filter uh, which we defined here to select pseudo log messages. And then we have a destination where we store the log messages. And we, when we use this configuration, here is how the traditional sudo log messages look like. These are really short and do not contain much information uh, due to the constraints of the original uh, syslog uh, specification. Uh, so uh, these, are, these were plain text, difficult to par parse log messages, and contain mm, just minimal information. If we turn on uh, JSON formatted logging with defaults log format equals JSON on the mm, sudo side, and then uh, we will have uh, JSON formatted logs uh, which have a lot more information and in an easy to parse uh, structured uh, format, which means that uh, many uh, log management applications can parse easily uh, these log messages and create filters or store just the necessary log messages, uh, lo uh, necessary, necessary fields from the log messages, and so on. Of course, uh, JSON formatted messages are difficult to read by, hu by humans, so there are many uh, utilities to uh, help you to read, like JQ. Uh, on the t terminal, but most of the time you will uh, forward these messages to Elasticsearch or uh, other applications where uh, they, they can be displayed in a human readable form. Now uh, let's have a slightly different syslogng configuration. What we change here is the file destination. We, st we have the same uh, filter and the same log path. But uh, in the file destination, uh, we, uh, instead of having a, a simple text file, we change to JSON formatting, where we include all of the syslog specific fields, and also uh, name value pairs are uh, recorded to the log message. Uh, what you do not see on the screen uh, is that uh, syslogng is parsing uh, sudo log messages automatically out of the box. So you do not have to enable any parsers yourself, but uh, it's done automatically. So uh, when you uh, store uh, the parsed log messages, then you see a nice long JSON formatted log message, which has all of the fields uh, from the uh, <coughs> sudo log and uh, from the syslog header. Uh, what you can see uh, here that all of the values here uh, have uh, quotes around them, which means that uh, syslogng treats all of, uh, in syslogng3, all of the uh, name value pairs are created as text out of the box, uh, which is uh, understandable from the syslog point of view as uh, it, um, your log messages are text. Uh, but uh, the various numbers are also treated as text, which is not really good if you want to create a report uh, 
in Elasticsearch or MongoDB or any other destination which is type aware. Uh, so what is coming up it, in SyslogNG.4, it's not really easy to spot as a human, but uh, for a JSON parser, it will be quite a difference that uh, when SyslogNG is parsing a JSON message or, use is when, or when using some of the parsers, then it, it's type aware. And, uh, for, uh, and for example, here is a number and there are no quotes around it, which means that it's treated as a number uh, and forwarded as a number uh, to the destination. And you do not have to do any tricks on the receiving side to treat it as a number, but it's automatically uh, used as a number. Then there's a list in there too. Yes, and the list is also, mm, and that's another improvement. Uh, back to uh, sudo, uh, in uh, 193, uh, change root and change working directory support was added to, uh, uh, to sudo. Uh, and Previously, there were quite a few situations where uh, you had to give the user full root shell access. If, for example, if one needed to start an application from a user inaccessible directory, uh, that's not a problem anymore, as you can uh, use the change working direct, direct uh, change root uh, change working directory option, and uh, you do not have to give root access or it was very, very easy to get full root access if you gave a user change root access on a system. Uh, the change root command, uh, command does need, uh, that needs root, root privileges, and even if uh, it was run through sudo, uh, it was easy to give uh, change root uh, the root directory, and then you got full root access on the host which is most likely not what you uh, try to achieve. Uh, change root uh, access needs to be enabled explicitly in the sudoers file, just like uh, change working directory, as there are two possible, possible ways how to uh, give the permissions to the user. One is giving a white card access, so uh, change root equals star, and uh, the, uh, the user can configure where to change root or uh, where to change working directory, but it has the uh, side effect that uh, the root directory can be used and th that uh, gives full access again. But the important change is uh, that at least it's logged nicely. So there is a new field uh, change root equal equals root, and you can easily create uh, an alert on it on syslogng. The other possibility is uh, fixing a directory uh, in the sudoers file, but uh, it has the side effect that all of the commands a user uh, tries to start is started from this directory. Uh, I'm not sure how much you can see uh, from this. I, ho I hope uh, you can see this. Uh, here, uh, what I changed is the log path, the filter and the file destination stay the same. Uh, to the log path, I added an if statement with, uh, that it's a, that's a filter practically. Uh, and he, I mentioned that uh, syslogng is parsing uh, sudo log messages automatically and creating name value pairs. Uh, this one is a name value pair. Uh, created by uh, syslogng, and this is the directory name where uh, sudo is change, change routing. So what I do here is matching, uh, is checking if uh, this uh, name value pair equals to, to the root directory, and in this case, I send an alert. Well, uh, here in my example, I store just to another file, uh, with a special formatting, uh, but uh, in a real-world situation, you can create an email alert or send a Slack message and receive it on your phone in real time. It's up to you uh, what you put here. The last uh, sudo features I want to talk about is uh, 
logging and intercepting subcommands. Uh, you could check what your users are doing even before uh, sudo 198 uh, added support for uh, logging and intercepting subcommands, but it was quite boring and time consuming. I mean, you need to, you had to uh, watch session recordings if you wanted to see what your users did in uh, when they accessed the shell through sudo. Us and I know uh, that some of the users have three day uh, long uh, sudo sessions, which are, let's say, quite boring to watch. Uh, with logging, you can uh, check your uh, log messages if there is uh, something uh, interesting in the session recording and then uh, watch the recording based on the log messages. It works on most in most cases, but of course not everything can be uh, cached by sudo uh, as, for example, built-in commands from shares uh, are not, not detected uh, by this method, as it, it's practically run by the shell directly. Uh, you can enable uh, subcommand logging using default log subcommands. And it's worth men mentioning that you got a lot. You get a lot more information uh, when you also enable JSON formatted logging. Here is a screenshot uh, from my favorite text editor, uh, and most of the text editors have a feature to run uh, uh, external comments or start a shell within the text editor. So here I started. Uh, a shell and then uh, run a few comments like ID and LS. These are nothing harmful, so uh, no harm was done to my uh, host. But uh, I, I, uh, as you can see, all what is logged is that I started my text editor, nothing more. Uh, when it, uh, th this is how sudo worked for many years. Uh, but if you enable sub, sub command logging, then uh, you see everything uh, what was done, even the uh, uh, various uh, commands started by, uh, by the profile uh, of the shell. So uh, he, uh, here, the, the first line is the very same as you could see on the previous slide, the te text editor starting, but then all of the various uh, a long, long list of what started by the shell automatically, and, and the last two lines are the uh, actual command lines I uh, executed from the shell. So no, no, uh, nothing uh, left uh, without logging. And if you are, uh, add uh, JSON formatted uh, logging to the mix, then it is much more easy to analyze uh, in the log messages uh, from uh, these sudo sessions, as there is a uh, UUID which is the same for all of the comments from the same sudo session. And also there are quite a few useful information about the uh, comments executed. Another possibility uh, is intercepting subcommands, which means that uh, you can prevent applications from running. Uh, Enabling this is a two-step process. First of all, uh, you have to enable intercepting uh, in the sudoers file, default uh, intercept, and then give the actual rules uh, to the sudoers file. In this case, my user is not allowed to execute the very harmful who command. Uh, here you can see that even if I have full root shell access on the given system, uh, when I try to uh, run a few who, then uh, I get a permission denied uh, message. Uh, so uh, you can prevent uh, this way uh, commands from running, even if you need to give uh, users full root shell access. Uh, you can also uh, disable shells this way, uh, but it has a couple of side effects. 
uh, here you can see how to do this do this defaults intercept then uh, here i created an alias uh, where i list a couple of shares uh, you can list here many more uh, but then in, uh, that doesn't fit the screen and then i disable running shares from for my user uh, but this also means that I cannot use uh, shares anymore. This is somehow expected. On the other hand, uh, I was a bit surprised when it came to uh, uh, playing with VI. I uh, wanted to start a command uh, from within a uh, VI text editing uh, session, but uh, us the sh uh, editor is using the shell to uh, run external commands. I could not run any external commands at all. Finally, a few words about what is coming in Sysdog NG4. Uh, I already mentioned uh, typing support. Why is it important? Because uh, you can uh, store uh, to, to Elasticsearch, MongoDB, SQL, SQL or anywhere uh, where you receive, for, uh, for example, in JSON formatted log messages, uh, the right type. So you do not have to mm, struggle on the receiving end to configure what data is what type. But uh, it, uh, it's automatically sent uh, with the right type. Uh, to use this, you need at least Sysdog NG version 3.37, but uh, already 3.38 is in FreeBSD ports and hopefully coming to others as well. Uh, so you can already test these features. Uh, the trick is that Sysdog NG configuration start with, uh, start with a version number. It is used to help to if anything is changing, uh, how a value within Sysdog NG is handled, the various defaults, it gives a kind of compatibility mode. And here we change this uh, version number to a future version, to version 4.0. And this way, uh, it, you can test Sysdog NG 4 features in the current release. Uh, so, uh, type information from pattern DB and JSON parsing are preserved. And for other parsers uh, or other data, you can rewrite uh, uh, type information manually. It's not so nice, but at least it works. So let me give you a quick summary of my talk. Uh, recent versions of sudo let you control uh, See, see and control a lot more activities than previously possible. You can get a lot more detailed and easier to use log messages. Uh, you, there is a lot less need for uh, giving users full root shell access. And even if you give them full root shell access, you can track what is happening inside and even prevent uh, some of the commands from running. And uh, using Sysdog NG, you have built-in support for uh, sudo log messages, which means that it's much easier uh, to create uh, alerts based on these messages or uh, store them to uh, NoSQL uh, or other type of our destinations. Uh, thank you for your attention. And let me know if you have any questions. Um, I, I had a question for you. Um, so in the Python world, the uh, Pydantic is all the, the hot stuff, right? Pydantic basically does all the typing conversions for you. Have you did you guys think about using something like that, or did you just write? Uh, what did you do to do the type conversion? Uh, the, this is, uh, right, uh, the current, cur uh, this is right now under development. This is the, uh, the Python support for um, type of our destination is uh close to merging but uh it's still something being worked on uh currently everything is treated as text oh okay yeah because i was just thinking um the solution is you, you could just throw like a an, an odm between the syslog and the mongo 
with something like that that supports Pydantic, like a Beanie, and it'll do all the typing conversions as it stores it in the database. Uh, cool. Even if you throw a, a string with numbers in it, it'll turn it into a number because it's like, oh, this is a this is a number. So, so just, uh, this is still under development. Okay. So. Uh... I will know more uh, more about it uh, probably about two weeks Sweet. from now. Okay. As uh, we had some discussions, what I couldn't too much uh, follow as I'm not a developer, uh, but, and they were discussing it at bit, uh, bit and by, bits and bytes level. <laughs> okay. But uh, hopefully, I will know, know more about it in in over two weeks. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just, just mention Pydantic and see what they say because. It's really cool. Um, the part where you, where, you, where you were talking about the um, pattern matching, like don't look at my credentials, also good to connect it to an external data store, like have a database which can dynamically be updated or reloaded. The pattern matching? Like you have a bad usernames or bad pattern list. Which you need to update? Yes, uh, we have a technology called Pattern DB. That's, uh, that's an ugly XML database, but at least it works. Uh, it, it's, uh, it implements pretty much what others implement using uh, regular expressions, but it, it's using, oh, what is it called? Something pre protocol, I, would, I don't know by from the top of my head. So it's much faster than using uh, regular expressions. It, you, you can describe a log message that where is your username, where is the IP address, where is everything, and uh, then uh, it will uh, pick out these values for you uh, from the log message and, uh, and with the right typing and everything. So this can be used uh, to store. To, to alert on various usernames, like when S, uh, root logs in as uh, uh, using SSH or whatever. Uh, and uh, it can also be type aware, so uh, if you parse numbers from it, then it will, uh, from, from uh, version four, it will be handled properly. I can, sh I can try to find you an, an example after the talk. Oh, and uh, I already mentioned I have a couple of stickers. Any other questions? Thank you. One more question. Ah. Thank you all. Stickers on the table there. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Really great talk. Thank you. Okay. And you have played around with this look engine in Kafka already. Yes, we have a Kafka destination. Oh yeah. Need to look into that. Uh, actually, it was developed. Oh, you all think it's not too old, isn't it? Uh, it's it's it? pretty pretty old, but uh, many distros enabled it in in the distro version of Cisco Genji okay. only recently. Ah, okay, but yeah. uh, it was developed probably five or six years ago. Okay. Uh, by a Swiss company. Ah, okay. They used Compute it. Work? Compute work? Yeah. Mm, I don't don't uh, 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 scale, so it's a hosting company, and they oh, okay. they use it pro for every, logging everything on their network. Yeah.
Uh, we also have a paper bag if you want to buy stuff. Uh, so right, so that's getting all up to date. Uh, there was someone who was thinking of the fix. Yeah. Uh, we moved, we swapped some parts last week or something, we have the schedule. Uh, so if you have no other print outs, just keep, keep an eye on the online schedule. Well, you can't click on anything and see an abstract. We, we, that was meant to be done. Okay. But we all looked at WordPress screens and decided that we didn't like you enough to get it to work. Uh, yeah, I have a solution for you. To not use WordPress? Yes, to use Pretox. It does everything for you. Yeah. Pretox. Uh, one minute. I'll pull it up. Events. Uh, pre talks. Let's take the config management one. Uh, okay. Uh, well, if you need a hosted one, just ping me. Yeah, and I'll get you uh, one. We we run open a slightly customized version of open to do the ticket sales and the pre, call pre ticks for the ticket sales. Pre talks for the yeah. event. So if you look at ours here. Um, well, uh, look at this I one. I believe that OSM is also capable of generating um, and displaying schedules. Okay. Uh, we've also done it thus far, all it's chosen to just make, uh, just stick it on the website. I think what I would really want. This uh, is the one. But it's, it's not going mm -hmm. to be my problem anymore. It is a static <laughs> website generator. Well, it's this one good. has it. So you can have this as a as it is now, but you yeah. can export it to a static site yeah, yeah. and then just host it there. Well, so. some, something that we can pipe mark down at and have it rendered that we do into yeah. with the HTML. I started looking and then I remembered why I never went with this. Yeah, but here you can go to this and yeah, then... Yeah, that's, that, that's what we okay. should have. And yeah. you can link it to YouTube, Vimeo and, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So. In, in previous years, we did manage to get the abstract and the speech of I was up. Uh, but this year, we activated the Elementor or something in WordPress, which is supposed to make it so much easier <laughs> to get your, uh, your data in. And my experience with it is that it becomes basically impossible. Yep. Well. Please do come in, but please remember your masks. So. Again, if you need help, yeah. just ping me. Thank you very much. Uh, but uh, well, I, I have solved the problem for me. Uh, in, uh, in, in a bit more than 24 hours, it's not possible. This is your, oh, is this, the, this is the open power for yeah. <laughs> Tomorrow the Linux one is tomorrow. I need to check the schedule, but this is, well, it's the second talk I attempt to watch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Would you like a speaking introduction or because I, I personally don't like speaking introductions because I will mispronounce your name, <laughs> get your background wrong, and then you will you will reintroduce yourself anyway. So okay, I, I think we should leave speaker introductions to subject matter experts. <laughs> well, I have a slide about who I am, so... <laughs> well, well, that is exactly my point about why I don't like speaker introductions. I will gladly pay along your behalf. <laughs> Did this... does this... Yeah. Uh, roller, does this mic work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yep, that's what I was looking at. And 
when when you're getting close to the end, it's like yeah, five minutes. <laughs> yep. You want known to roll heavy objects. That that is probably the gruesome lie that happened only once. <laughs> Well, Today. you've been <laughs> no, no, <it's> <laughs> you've been to load days, no, Christoph? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, we, we hand out beers and we throw beers around at load days, <laughs> so that's nicer. <laughs> uh, we had a speaker at nine in the morning say, "Oh, I could use a beer," and one of the organizers goes and puts a beer on the table. The <laughs> point <laughs> is that there might wall break up. I just go into like the wall. I don't think it will go over, but we'll see. Otherwise, if there were questions, we would you know, shuffle you all five, ten minutes so that we can do a room change. But we've got go around and 15 minutes to break after your talk, so just go as long as you want. Okay. Um, I'm getting started. I'm not wearing my mask so that you can actually hear me better. So, uh, but you are supposed to keep your masks on. Uh, so yeah, this is the talk about FreeBSD on open power. Um, I will be going over some uh, history. Um, so open power as in the Open Power Foundation. I'll be going over some history of, of power in general. Um, I'll be talking about what FreeBSD is doing and what we are trying to do from the foundation to help FreeBSD. Um, the idea is to replicate this for OpenBSD, NetBSD, and any other BSD in the world. Um, but this talk just shows efforts that we're doing now with FreeBSD. So yeah, who am I? Uh, my name is Toshan Barvani. Um, I have my company. Uh, we are involved in open source. I'm mostly a Linux user, so I've been a Linux user for about 25 years. I've been a BSD user for about 10 years, so not that long. Um, I'm not a BSD developer, so I'm just a user. I will now get more acquainted with development. Uh, because of the efforts I'm trying to do, but I'm not at this point. Um, and yeah, you have a whole list of stuff I do. Um, I run some conferences, so Config Management Camp, which will run after FOSDEM if you're interested, and Load Days, which is a smaller one. Um, and then yeah, I have a blog and a Twitter handle. Um, I am also now the uh, TSC, so that's the Technical Steering Committee Chair at the Open Power Foundation, so that's the foundation that uh, tries to lead the efforts around uh, open power. So like I said, a short introduction, an overview of what we're doing with the foundation. Uh, so if you see OPF, that's Open Power Foundation, um, but I sometimes I'm lazy and I don't write it fully. Um, and then the road to open power, so some history, uh, some other efforts that have been done and are, that we're doing, uh, what FreeBSD has done on their own already, and what we are trying to achieve. Um, and then some developer resources um, that are currently available, that we are making available, and that will become available soonish. So yeah, the Open Power Foundation was founded in 2013. Uh, we have more than 300 members. Uh, we typically have working groups, so we are divided in working groups, and then everybody can focus on that specific area. Um, in 2019, we had some new leadership. Um, they wanted to be more software driven um, and keep the hardware driven part in there so that there's a more tight integration between software and hardware. Um, we want to also have newer interactions with the communities, uh, which is why people like me come and talk here to get interaction from people. Um, I list the board members not because you need to see it, but just to understand that it's not just IBM anymore. This is typically a misconception that, oh, power is IBM. Yes, IBM invented power. Yes, they are still one of the main uh, companies behind it, but they are no more the only company behind it. Um, so in many of these efforts, you will see that there are also other companies, smaller companies that are involved in these efforts. So yeah, some of the goals, so create an, an open power architecture. Um, so typically, um, previously you had hardware manufacturers that just built stuff um, and then they try to sell it. Uh, so now we're trying to create more of an ecosystem where people can get value from. Um, 
We also want to have interactions with the academic world so that we can have more cross-discipline uh, uh, inter incentives. Um, we are building what we call uh, a landscape. Um, so if you know the CNCF landscape, um, then we're building something similar to that, which is basically an overview of which software runs on power. So just trying to find ways to um, get all the information on one portal. Um, and for, for instance, for the distributions, uh, BSD is going to be one of the, the areas that we want to support. Uh, but also for other projects around BSD, we want them to be listed and to be uh, maintained and give resources to the ecosystem so that they can actually maintain it in the future themselves. Um, one of the other interesting things is that now the ISA, so the Instruction Set Architecture, was contributed to the foundation, uh, which means that people can actually see what is happening, see the evaluation, uh, can give feedback. Um, there are specific rules about like who can vote and who can do stuff, but you can still come to the meetings, you can still interact with people, uh, you can still give your opinion. You might not always get what you want, but that's typical when you have a, a so many members trying to pull uh, each way. Uh, we have connections with like open copy, so for acceleration. Um, I know we've, we've tried looking at ZFS and, and doing acceleration on compression, on encryption. Um, so that's where the, the CXL open copy is now um, looking at. Um, previously, those were two separate consortiums. Now they're being merged into one. Um, for the software enablement, we have created what we're calling the Open Power Foundation Hub. Um, so that's basically several providers that will give free access to power machines because the machinery that is currently available isn't cheap. It's not something you, you as a developer typically would buy and put under your desk. Um, if you put it under your desk, you might get confused that you have an airplane below your desk because when it starts, it's so noisy you can't hear yourself think. Um, so we are having some efforts around this. Um, one of the things I did when I became the TSC is that we are now running the foundation on open power technology and all open source technology. So the website has been migrated. Um, our infrastructure for the members has been migrated. Uh, our chat system runs actually on power. Um, for the moment, majority runs on Linux. Um, I am looking to change that also to some BSD stuff so that we can actually prove that it works on anything. Um, so th the, the idea there was like, we, we have proprietary tools which build open source technologies. Why can't we use open source technologies to build open source technologies? Um, and in that effort, we have, we've come a long way. We haven't finalized everything. There are still some proprietary stuff in there, which I'm trying to move, uh, which will happen over time. Um, and one thing to remember, it's not just enterprise focused. Uh, yes, IBM is IBM and will focus on enterprise, um, but there are, like I said, many other members like Inspur, Winston, um, and some new ones like Red Semi, which are focusing on smaller devices uh, and going back to the networking stack, uh, going back to um, the uh, embedded world. So the things that was, were known on the power PC are coming back now again. But not by IBM because they don't have a focus on that. But they will help enable the ecosystem. So here's an overview of all the work groups. You find this also on the website. Um, the, the interesting one is maybe the Power ISA. Um, if you're writing uh, low level coding and you want to be able to get all the upcode optimization, um, that's a work group you can join. Um, you need to be a member to join that one. Now you can become an individual member at no cost. So uh, only if your company wants to become a member, then there's a whole costing. Uh, you can find that on the website. I'm not going to go through that. But as individuals, you can become a member. Um, if you're part of the FreeBSD Foundation, as the FreeBSD Foundation is a member, you can get access through them also. Um, I am hoping to talk to OpenBSD and NetBSD as they also have foundations and let them join in because for the foundation it doesn't cost any money, it's just some paperwork, but then you can through the foundation get access on that. Um, yeah, the system software work group is the other one which is very interesting. Uh, that's the one where we uh, create the documentation and the specifications for the architecture. 
Um, so primarily in the past it was Linux focused. Um, now that I've come in, I'm trying to open it up and get people from BSD also to be there. IBM has already people at, at some of the BSD uh, and they are trying to get more open in that way and not only focused on Linux um, because when the, when the platform was opened up to the world, it was Linux focused. Now we need to open it up to everyone. Um, the hub is the one that would actually document like how to port and how to optimize. Uh, is also the one where you can get access to these type of uh, resources. I'll come back on that later. Um, the Lever BMC is another new one um, that's actually taking the BMC, uh, which today has an open source software stack, but we're also trying to open source the hardware. So it runs on an FPGA. Uh, you get a soft core, you can program it all, you can compile it yourself, and you'll be able to uh, use it yourself. I have some pictures later on on how that looks and which machines actually can can run that. Um, then the ones with a the star there, so the Power Pi is our initiative to get developer boards. Um, I'll come back on that later in detail, but it's basically more affordable dev boards because when I come to the development resources, you will see it's not that cheap for the moment. Um, and we will be starting the ambassadors also. Um, so I think Peter would be very interested in that. Um, but the ambassadors was actually on hold because of COVID because there's not a lot of activity. Uh, so now that, that we are having more in-person events, we will start that uh, also. So yeah, um, the road to open power. So power as as the architecture was actually a research project at IBM. Um, power stands for performance with enhanced risk. Um, so it then trickled down to the RTPC, which was a, a workstation desktop that they made. Um, then there was the Tadpole and the ThinkPad. So there were several editions of PowerPC in a laptop. Um, and I bring that up because later on we will see initiative uh, to to do something similar. Um, so those were there, now they don't exist anymore. Then the RS6000, which is the most known one, and which is what the current architecture was derived from. Um, we then have Power, or PowerPC, which is the AIM, so Apple, uh, IBM, and Motorola joined forces to make this. Um, it had a lot of embedded use, so a lot of the switches in the past were actually running PowerPC uh, CPUs. Um, that one also went to Mars. Um, so if you go to Mars ever, you can still find a, a power PC machine there. Um, but so, and then it went more to, towards power.org, which was the Mars server and the enterprise. And at that point, IBM pushed their server and enterprise um, view on, on the power architecture. And a lot of the embedded stuff basically died out and and there is where uh, we also see that a lot of the development has stopped at that point i mean if if i ask the people in the hall here everybody will know power pc as in the apple mac um, the g4 the g5s uh, people will hardly know that it is in in some of the cisco routers or in some of the cisco switches um, or even northdale switches um, so so that's when the um, the focus actually was lost. Um, now with what we are calling the Power ISA, um, which is the foundation actually taking over and becoming more uh, interactive, um, we are trying to get a focus for, for those type of uh, use cases again. So there are efforts to make uh, switches again with uh, power. Um, there are efforts um, on making more privacy aware machines. Um, so that machinery is fully open. People can actually examine what it is. Um, and there's actually currently already a vendor who is selling machines in that way. So they give you the full documentation on everything. They even give you the specifications of the motherboard, the layouts and, and where all the blobs are. Um, you can actually rebuild that all yourself. Um, the only thing, of course, is you need to also rebuild some of the learning data and that can be a little bit more intense uh, work for somebody who isn't used to that. Um, another thing is that in this effort, uh, so a year after the foundation was started with the release of Power 8, 
IBM open source the, the firmware. Um, and so what, what is typically called OPAL, it's the open power uh, abstraction layer. It's basically composed of OCC, which brings up your machine. Um, then Hostboot initializes all the um, uh, interfaces and the I.O. And then Skiboot actually uh, bootstraps the kernel. Um, and at this moment, obviously, that is a Linux kernel. But we should be able to swap that out to a BSD kernel. Um, and then Petit Boot, which is basically just a, a, a 2E, so a text-based interface, so that people can easily select which uh, boot they want to do. So similar to what you go to your UEFI menu or your um, BIOS menu. Uh, we do have Core Boot um, that is being actively developed. Um, they're actually busy. Um, they have some alpha uh, releases, so you can actually buy a Talos 2 and get Core Boot running on it. Uh, the BMC software was uh, opened up a little bit later. Um, that was only the software stack, so it's still an A speed on that, uh, which is a closed proprietary system. Um, and so that software stack is open on all the dev machines that you can get your hands on. You can actually compile your own uh, BMC software and put it on it. Um, so now we started an effort called Libre BMC, not to be confused with the Open BMC. That's why we chose a different name. Um, and that was actually to have an open source BMC hardware. Um, now, because of the way that that's working and because of some other influencers uh, within the foundation, that's an FPGA-based implementation. Um, and that makes it that you can actually uh, run a soft core like Microbot or LibreSoc, uh, which is a fully open source um, software core, um, which typically could then be made into an actual CPU. Uh, but you can actually program them, you can inspect what it's doing, you can see everything that's happening on that board. Uh, yeah, sorry, there's a spelling mistake, but it's several machines have open source, so Raptor is one of those who have done it. Um, IBM has two machines that is also fully open sourced um, and some of the, the Taiwanese manufacturers like Tian and Winston also open source their machines. Um, so if you look at some of the technologies, so this is of course an older version, the Power 8, which was the first one that was released within the foundation. We have, and the reason why I write the, the V2.07 is because unlike Linux, we don't want to make the same mistake of only saying Power 8, which is an IBM processor. So the ISA standard is the V2.07. Um, and so even if you have other manufacturers making cores, they might not implement all the opcodes the same way. Uh, some of the opcodes are optional. Some of them are mandatory. There are actually different levels in the ISA. Um, so you can then have different sets of uh, type of processors. Um, so yeah, IBM made them, but you see Google also had their own uh, machines. Rackspace had them. Raptor is the one that, that is the most well-known one uh, because it's, it's mostly promoted for their openness and their uh, individual um, accessibility of the hardware. Uh, but if you look, there are also some Chinese vendors. And so those Chinese vendors at the time made their own CPUs. So they're not running the IBM CPUs, they run their own that were manufactured by them. Um, if we go to the next step, is the Power 9 or the V3.0. Um, we have the Raptor one, which is today available. So you have the Talos 2 uh, or the Talos 2 Lite, which are the most common ones um, and the most affordable ones for the moment. But you see other companies are still making uh, power machines. Obviously, this is from the enterprise perspective. Um, and it's still all rank-based server machinery. Uh, but if you go to the next one, we'll actually see some uh, other ones. Um, so we have LibreSoc, uh, which is for the moment a software uh, core. Um, which basically means if you have any FPGA today, you can already run it. You have Red Semi, uh, which is actually taking the LibreSoc designs and putting that in, in silicon and actually going to build the CPUs. Uh, so we hope to have those ready by middle of next year, where you will actually have 
non-IBM power CPUs. Um, one of them is going to be targeting networking, uh, so they, they have a gigabit router design um, that they are building uh, with help of the EU, for instance. So, um, And then we have the new, well, not new, it's an old effort, a PowerPC laptop project, um, currently only available with the E6500 car, uh, but we are hoping to, to update that to a newer car. Uh, but these are the efforts that are going on. So you even see like Microsoft and Google, uh, they offer this in their cloud. Uh, sometimes you might not know that because it's optimized or specialized hardware. Um, so if you run certain code, like uh, you want to do some high encryption, it might be running on a power in place of an x86 machine or even an ARM machine. So there are a lot of misconceptions. Um, one, well, technically there are no open power machines. Um, there's open power technology and then vendors make their machines actually. Um, power isn't for enterprises only. Uh, yes, IBM is of course focusing only on that market, uh, but we do have other new vendors that are focusing on the other side. Um, power isn't really open source, it is. Actually the entire stack is open. Um, and you can find the specifications today on GitHub, um, on the foundation website. And one of the problems we are facing is that this is so scattered everywhere. So we're trying to consolidate all that information in one place. And in that way, it will be easier for developers to find that. Uh, yeah, IBM is in power. Um, so, I mean, IBM is obviously the inventor of it and still the main uh, party involved, but it's no more the only party involved and there will be other people building CPU cores. Uh, well, there are other people building CPU cores that will be available next year. Um, yeah, so it isn't ancient yet and it isn't dying yet. So what did FreeBSD do? Uh, FreeBSD actually ported to Power8, um, so they, they have their PowerPC 64LE um, which you can actually use to bootstrap and, and to add uh, support. So it's for the moment tier two only. Um, there are a lot of ports that aren't fully supported. Um, that's where we are trying to put the effort into getting more developers involved on one hand, but also being able to uh, see how much uh, uh, feedback we can get from actual users using these machines. Um, so we need to work on that. Uh, the FreeBSD Foundation has been very helpful in that. They actually have people who are doing that now already. Uh, and we have worked out a loaner that should be soon at the, at the foundation. Um, and then they will actually have full access. They already have several machines, but with this additional machine, it, might, it should make the ports uh, easier to work on. Um, so there are some people within the FreeBSD community uh, who have done that. Um, so those are the three main people involved in the project. Um, so you, I mean, I would at least like to thank them that they already did this before I was involved. Um, but with, with our involvement, we hope to get more people. Um, if you have specific projects or sub projects you want to promote or to get posted, uh, let us know. Um, the Open Power Foundation is also a foundation. It's not like we have money like other companies or, or that like Intel that spend or throw money at, at developers, uh, but we can work on, on certain type of uh, uh, solutions in that area. So yeah, I, I came to this conference to, to talk to the other BSD. So um, I think yesterday I spoke to NetBSD. Um, so they, they were showing some interest. Um, I'm trying to talk to the people of OpenBSD. They also already have some uh, uh, functionality with power, but fairly limited for the moment. So we want to expand that also. Um, so the basic idea is just to have all BSD supported on this um, and to have it into the stack so that in future when we write documentation, it's not just focused on Linux, but it's focused on any type of open source uh, operating system that is out there. Um, and with that effort, we will hopefully get also more users, people who are more aware of what they need and want. So the developer resources. 
currently if you want to buy one now you only have two choices uh if you want something slightly affordable <laughs> so you have the xc922 developer machine which is a a machine if you buy from ibm at fifty thousand euros list price which they are promoting at five thousand for developer purposes so we got them down to one tenth of the price but it's still a lot of money for the developer and we i mean we are not kidding ourselves um so yeah if you want you can buy them at ibm in the us or in in one of the resellers in in the eu um the other one raptor which is touted as the most open source one um again it comes to a similar price tag um you can buy it from raptor in the us there is a, a reseller now viking store um i think a Dan a german company uh, which is reselling it um which makes it at least easier for a developer to get access because previously you would have to buy that raptor import it yourself and do all the paperwork so it makes life easier but again this isn't something you can buy and put under your desk uh, even though the talos is considered a workstation um it's going to be loud and noisy and i think viking is busy working with raptor on making water cooling um so it's actually going to be a little bit quieter um but yeah it's it's still very expensive let's not joke about that so what do we have that is maybe another current solution are these fpga based devices so an fpga you can typically get around 200 to 50 um there are even ones at 50 euros um so you have a, i think it's a butter stick or something like that uh, which sells at like 75 euros microwatch should work on that um if you're active in that space um i would suggest joining the Libre bmc because that's where most of the effort and the discussions are going on uh, but we have two soft powers so microwatt and librasoc um, and we will have by middle of next year a third soft car um, that will also implement the full power isa stack um, so here are two examples so this is an, uh, an arctic a7 so that's around 200 euros so it's still okay um, and that's an ecp5 um, dcsm board um, also around 200 euros but again here it means that you need to compile your own uh, software core and then you can only start doing the work on top of that um, it's not exactly the same like what you get in physical hardware there are some differences and those will always be different uh, but if you want to start playing with stuff this might be the cheapest and the quickest solution uh, than the previous options then uh, like i mentioned a little bit earlier uh, the open power hub initiative so this is where we give resources for free uh, to developers uh, it's cloud-based um, there are for the moment five providers um, you can get bare metal access with serial console so if you're doing low level stuff you can get access to that um, you can even get access to several fpgs and i'm not talking about the 200 euro fpj but like a 15,000 or 30,000 euro fpj which is like a very heavy one which uh, um, storage acceleration and uh, encryption acceleration or compression accelerations um, so accelerator access is something we're also trying to push um, for things like crypto or um, compression uh, for the moment the compression algorithms aren't always fully optimized if you have any uh, ideas or projects around that uh, let us know and we'll see how we can help you uh, so we have the different providers there each one offers slightly different options uh, but we have two in the us uh, one in brazil uh, and then two commercial slash uh, um, free ones uh, so raptor has the integrity cloud they obviously offer talos based machines at that uh, and then my company also has a few machines that we use uh, in our rack and in the lab that you can get access to um, some of them like the mini cloud is a limited access so you only get it for limited time um, if you want long term oregon state university will be the one that will offer long term uh, open source uh, and they have the most hardware so they have uh, at this point i think around a dozen systems um, 
whereby my company has maybe about five of them. Um, and Raptor has obviously much more because they produce the machines. Um, so you can go to that website, there's a form there, you can fill it in. Um, if you have, if the form doesn't suit your needs, you can use that email address to email. Um, and then somebody from the hub will pick that up and, and discuss with you what you can do. Um, if all that fails, you can mail me. Uh, because like I said, we, we really want to do an effort on getting more open source tooling and more open source projects on this. Um, and the only way is if you come up with an idea and we help you in some way. Um, like I said, we, we have resources available. We might not be able to throw money at you, um, but there are resources that we can at least give you. And then the, the infamous PowerPi, um, I've been speaking about this for a while. We haven't got to production yet, so we do have a plan. We have a design that is more or less ready. Um, it's not yet ready to put in silicon yet, but we are working on that. Um, so it's basically a, a, a single board computer, similar to the Power Pi, uh, sorry, similar to a Raspberry Pi. Um, we will start with a dual core Power V 3.0, so it's similar to a Power 9 to the dev boards you saw. Um, we are trying to get a uh, BMC integrated, um, so it will have a small FPGA that you can then flash and program yourself. Um, or you can get the standard image. Um, or my acceleration was planned, but I think we will have to scratch that out if we want to be ready by middle of next year. Uh, but this is going to be a, a platform that will be mainly focused on developers being, to put, being able to put it under their desk or on their desk and say, okay, this is something I can play with. The price tag we are targeting with this is 500 euros. It isn't cheap yet as a Raspberry Pi, but it is at least, again, a level down uh, from the current dev uh, machines that we are at. Um, and the reason why I say there will be several, several versions and generations is because hopefully in the next one we can go to a lower price range, um, and then if we can sell enough of them or give enough of them away, uh, we can convince some other players to put in money and to actually be able to um, give some of fully freely away to developers. So yeah, my conclusion is we need to empower BSD um, and make sure that BSD isn't left out on the platform. Um, a lot of efforts are being put in Linux, um, but I, I personally think we also need BSD support. Do you have any questions? I do. Okay. I have a very mean question. Okay. How would you say that power differs from RISC V? Uh, well, that's not a mean question. Um, it's typically a question I avoid because of personal uh, involvement. So my opinions are, of course, because I'm a, a power user, a power developer, um, but the main difference between RISC-V and power is in power you have stable ISA releases. You have a guarantee that opcodes will be the same in the future because there's only one body that can push that forward. The other difference is in risk 5 you have a hidden problem which many people do not know of and that is the whole IP that risk 5 is built on is flawed by definition. So if one of the patent trolls actually attacks risk 5 risk 5 would have to close the entire foundation. Um, and their members are also not covered. So technically if let's say let red semi is one of these examples. They um, are an offspring of LibreSoc, which is an open source project. They became member of the foundation, but by becoming member of the foundation, they automatically get patent guarantee and uh, patent uh, enablement from the foundation and indirectly from IBM, because IBM is still one of the main players there um, in that space. So if they tomorrow produce something that is compliant with the Power ISA stack, 
they know that if there is a patent war going on, IBM and the foundation will help them. A risk five that doesn't exist. Think about as the uh, as NATO for patents for the ISA. Sorry? I could think about as NATO for, for patents for the ISA. Yes. You will have uh, 3D. Yes. And presumably, if you join the foundation, you commit to not using your patents to deny anyone else the ability to use power. No, you have to. So let's say, like, Red Semi is now um, coming in with a, a proposal. I can't tell you which proposal yet because it's still yeah. being discussed. Uh, but if that proposal comes in, what happens at that point is those that technology that they have developed will become an inbound patent to the foundation. And then anybody within the foundation can use that patent. So you contribute your patent to the foundation. Yeah. Uh, another problem with risk five, um, and and maybe I know a little bit too little to to say that fully, um, is that risk five does not have the same ability um, in producing CPUs which are compatible with each other, um, and so you can have a, a, a CPU of risk five that has specific opcodes, and you can have a different CPU that has those same opcodes doing different things. In power, that's not possible. That's illegal by definition, and you actually need to create illegal traps for that. Um, so in the long term, the divergence between risk five players is going to be very big, while the, the divergence within the power is going to be limited, because you have the ISA stack, so you have a fixed, sorry, fixed point, you have floating point, you have a uh, little endian and you have big endian those are the four compliancy stacks you come to now it means that if you want to build an embedded processor you typically will do sffs so a uh, scalar fixed floating point um, but it also means that you can take some of the upcodes from the little endian one now it does it you cannot take just any upcode from anywhere so do you have these four levels you have also a bunch of optional upcodes like mma uh, which is in power 10 is an optional one. So you could get a CPU that doesn't have MMA. Now, if we built the uh, ecosystem in such a way that you can define that, which is what we are trying to do with the Linux world where there have been many mistakes, is where you can then say that if the CPU has MMA support, execute those opcodes. But in the long term, the divergence between risk five is going to be a hell. And, and to be fairly honest, looking at their way of working and their foundation and the way that they allow members to do things, it is going to be at some point a problem. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. I'm going to the main uh, question. Um, you didn't get uh, Robert DF for Power 10, and I remember that they announced that there probably won't be Power 10. YouTube issues. They didn't explain why well, or why. Um, has there been some development or has this been disclosed by now? Okay, so first thing first. Raptor makes Power 9 machines? Yes. Raptor does not make Power 10 machines. Raptor's tweet and block, I don't think they made a blog post, but they, they tweeted about it, is that they're not making Power 10 machines because there is a binary blob there that cannot be rebuilt. That is not true. That binary blob that they claim is actually documented on GitHub. So uh, I don't have the link with me now instantly, but you can send me a mail and I can send you the link where you can find how you build that binary blob. Yes, it needs to be a binary blob when you put it into the machine, but there is a way for you to rebuild it and to do a binary verification. So it isn't fully open, um, and that is not because IBM wants it, that's because another company uh, called Microchip hasn't provided the RTL to that. But they have provided how to build the RTL to it. Um, and that's where Raptor is, is creating a fuss. Um, now, in my opinion, if you know how to build it, and it's it's not publicly available, but the description is, it's still good, in my opinion. IBM has been trying to convince Microchip to fully open source it, as in put the code actually out there. 
Um, I hope that at some point they can do that. Um, I know the person involved in that, she is very adamant in getting this done so that we can get this misconception out of the road and the actual code is there. Um, but it's, it's not IBM's decision, it's Microchip's decision. So that's the reason why there is no Power 10 uh, from, uh, from Raptor. Another reason why I presume Raptor is not going for Power 10 is they have stocked up on so many Power 9s, they haven't sold the quantities that they expected, and at that price range you can imagine they're not, I mean, this isn't the system just for anyone. Even if it would be at half price, it would still be affordable for a workstation, uh, but at this price it isn't super affordable. And that's the reason why I think they aren't going to Power 10, and they're trying to find some excuse why they're not doing it in place of just being honest and saying, we're not going to do it, we'll skip to Power 11 because we just don't have the resources. I mean, it's not only about resources of humans, but also of money. I mean, Tim Pearson, the, the owner of the company, has invested a lot of money, a lot of time. Uh, he needs to make money so that he can do the next stuff. And he has done a lot of n nice things. I mean, he has a new FPGA, um, which will actually replace the A-Speed FPGA. Um, I can't tell you the, the exact system yet, because I don't think they released it yet. Um, but it's basically a card you can put in, and then you have an FPGA. So like Lieber BMC, his version is called Run BMC. Um, it's a different name, but it does exactly the same thing. So yeah, I don't think they will be one of the players for Power 10. I hope that changes. Any other questions, remarks, suggestions? Not no, not yet. Uh, I will help you tackle. Okay. okay, thank you. I guess my question is like, what's the, what would you say is the minimum developer experience required? Like, like what, what would you be doing as a developer on the product? You're just trying to port the software to the, the power architecture? We want it to be easy for people to port to power, and we want it to be so easy that if you have a CI CD pipeline, you can just add it in there and it should just build. One of the, the reasons um, that IBM chose for Little Endian and is pushing Little Endian in the Linux world is because compatibility with the Intel world and the ARM world is so much easier. Personally, sorry? Sorry? Uh, I didn't hear it. To, to, to summarize your argument, the problem is that software development I, I was just going to say, in, in IBM's infinite wisdom, they thought that software developers are idiots in place of letting the software developer be smart. Now, obviously, they are targeting actually the more Intel-based ones, which think that there's nothing outside of Intel. And, and the problem there, again, is a lot of the good developers just don't have time to do stuff. They're so busy with their work that you need to sometimes have other people be involved in this. And personally, I, I'm against what, what they're doing on that level, but I can't change that on my own. Um, we, as in my company, still has Big Endian running on multiple places, and we will continue to try to support that. Um, and we actu I actually have spoken to the foundation that we should do that. Um, and from the foundation, we are doing that. It's IBM who's pushing Little Endian. And the reason why I think they're also pushing it is because in many cases, it makes stupid developers' lives easier. And they just want to be quick and dirty about stuff. They don't care about every little nitty gritty detail. Because they are a commercial company. I mean, they need to make money, obviously. I mean, we also need to make money so that we can pay our bills and do our stuff. But we like to be correct. They, they, they're not always that correct with everything. Any more questions? Thank you very much for your okay. talk. Thank you.